Good morning, Southgate. I want to welcome you and we want to thank you for joining us online. If we have not met yet, my name is Brett. I am the intern, the new intern here at Southgate. And especially with restrictions uh, changing in the near future, if you are curious as to what's happening here in the life of our church, feel free to follow us on all, on all of our social media platforms or you can sign up for our newsletter and receive updates for the ministries as we get those updates. Um, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your ongoing giving through this time. And if you're interested in what your giving options are, they are they're right here on the screen in case you are curious. Currently, we do have our children's ministry in person. If you feel comfortable, feel free to come and join us in person for our children's ministry. But if you're not comfortable, you don't feel well, we still do have our children's ministry online that you can check out. Today, we have someone who has chosen to get baptized and wants to take their, that step in their journey with God. So here is his testimony. So feel free to just listen to his story. Hey, I'm Adam Post, and today I'm getting baptized. Um, my whole life, I grew up in a Christian home, Christian parents. My sister recently got baptized, so I've always been kind of around God. But, um, you know, as life goes on, you hang out with the crowd and you kind of stray away from God. And um, I've kind of learned that when I'm with God and around God, it, um, life it just goes a lot better. And it's not always easy, but yeah. So I think baptism is an outward expression of the inner decision to follow Jesus and I want to do that in my life and I want to follow the Lord and I'm getting baptized because I love the Lord and because I want Him in my life. I personally find it very encouraging just to hear how God really just transforms lives. So let's continue to celebrate that as we transition into worship, but first let me pray for us. God, we welcome your presence. We pray that you move in our hearts, that you continue to reveal yourself to us, God. And I pray that you speak to us by name today and you challenge us, transform us, and um, lead us into your presence. In your name we pray, amen.
All right, so we are in week four of our series, Decisions, Decisions, and uh, we're going to be talking about what it means to seek wisdom over knowledge. And uh, we're going to start off uh, doing the same game that we've kind of been doing throughout uh, this series. And it's fun because this was a game that I used to play as a youth pastor as kind of a get to know you game. Um, we would we would give people uh, decisions. We would say, you know, would you rather statements? And then we would get people to actually physically move around the room and they'd have to, you know, what always ended up happening was people defend their decision. And so uh, there's often some really fun conversations. So let's, let's have a look at a couple of these here. So uh, number one, uh, so put, put your hand up if uh, you would rather dress casual. If you like your more comfortable clothes, uh, things like that. Uh, okay, hands down. And, and if you would rather... Uh, dress formal. Put your hands up now. Okay, hands down. Uh, next, would you rather it be hot? Would you rather it be uh, just ridiculously warm outside? Put your hands up. Okay, put your hands down. And uh, if you would rather it be cold, I think you're crazy, but put your hand up. Okay, now put your hand down. Um, and of course, very controversial here. Do you like socks with sandals? Okay, so if you are pro socks, put your hand up. Pro socks, all right, hands down. And if you are pro no socks, uh, put your hands up. All right, put your hands down. And of course, extremely controversial, is the dress black and blue or is it white and gold? Put your hands up for black and blue. Okay, put your hands down. Put your hands up for white and gold. All right, you're all wrong. Uh, black and blue is what it is. And um, of course, uh, we have a lot of fun uh, with those types of decisions. But often in life, we are faced with uh, much more difficult decisions, uh, options that we really have to uh, weigh out in our minds. And uh, when, we, when we really get rolling here at the church, um, we can sometimes get to uh, about a month out. We know what sermons are going to be preached when and uh, what kinds of things we're going to be covering. And so uh, uh, sometimes I know well in advance what I'm going to be speaking on. And uh, this was one of those times. I, I was actually given the topic of wisdom over knowledge about uh, a month or so ago before the Christmas break. Um, and so it's been something I've been thinking about a lot. And uh, as many of you know, our Christmas break was, uh, was quite eventful. On uh, December 30th, we welcomed uh, little baby Eli into our family. And uh, he's fitting in quite well. You can see him uh, here next with his brothers. And, uh, and so we had a moment where they were not at each other's throats. And uh, we got them to sit together. We, you know, moved them in and posed them and uh, quickly snapped a shot before chaos ensued uh, again. And so this was the result. Uh, we had an awesome break. But all throughout the break, I'm thinking about this topic. I'm thinking about wisdom over knowledge. Uh, I'm trying to decide uh, what, what direction I feel God is leading me in as I prepare for this message. Um, I, I'm thinking about this as my kids are uh, throwing things at each other. I'm thinking about this as uh, my family and I are enjoying some downtime. And uh, it just kept going over and over in my head. And every thought, every conviction that I had um, it would sit in my head and heart for a while and, and I would come back and, and I would just say to myself, I don't think I can preach on that because I feel like I'm not there yet. I feel like this is convicting for me. This is great for me. This is something that I really need to grow in. This is something that I really need motivation in. But I felt hypocritical kind of talking about it. And uh, I just want to be honest here today that, that this message um, is very much coming from my heart 
as a, a place that, that I need to be working on, something that I really need to be doing and living out more and more each day. And so I want to invite you into uh, this journey that I'm going on with some convictions that God is giving me. Um, we live in a world of information. Uh, it's easy to become an expert on anything. Uh, you know, we can make jokes about how, you know, a Google search can often give you a lot of misinformation, but the reality is there is a lot of good information at our fingertips these days. You no longer have to travel to um, university libraries and, uh, and massive institutions to find uh, good material. A lot of it is available for us online. I would say that this is probably the most one of the most educated cultures um, and societies in history. Um, and when it comes to faith, this is a great gift. Um, there is so much knowledge to be had out there. There's so much knowledge about our faith that we can take in. I have programs on my computer that make it easy for me to, sh to, to shift through and sift through um, uh, archives and all sorts of things that would have taken hours and hours and hours to do hundreds of years ago, I can do in seconds now. But the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, there's all of this knowledge about our faith that's out there. We need to be asking, is our faith really about obtaining knowledge for belief? Or is there something more? Is there something more? Is our faith more than just knowing about what to believe? See, often the Christian faith can be presented to us as a set of truth claims uh, that we must understand in order to take our next step in understanding more and knowing more. It often feels like faith is just about knowing the right things. And to be sure, the Bible teaches that obtaining knowledge can definitely be a good thing. But as you study the Bible more, you will see and you will begin to see that there is something far greater than knowledge that we are told to seek. And that is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. Now, before we get too far, let's define what we mean by knowledge and wisdom. So first off, knowledge is the acquaintance with facts, truths, or principles as from study or investigation. So it's, it's the kind of concrete stuff that you can obtain, uh, skills, gifts, things like that, that you can acquire. Um, wisdom. See, wisdom is knowledge of what is true or right. And here's the key, coupled with just judgment as to action. See, wisdom is all about applying knowledge. Wisdom is all about what you are going to do with what you know. Um, this, this kind of difference between knowledge and wisdom, it, it makes me think of uh, the character Sheldon Cooper on uh, The Big Bang Theory. Um, he's, he's kind of this quirky physicist. He lives with his, his roommate who is also a physicist, and he has zero social skills. And there, there was an episode where he talks about having all of the knowledge of social skills and how to interact with people and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. He's got all of this knowledge, but he has no wisdom. He doesn't know how to actually apply that knowledge. And so I wonder... I wonder if we as Christians often have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of things that we have been inputting into our lives, but we don't have a lot of wisdom. And we need to learn to seek wisdom. Now, I don't think it's just wisdom that the Bible tells us to seek because there are all sorts of different forms of wisdom. It's very specific. It's, it's God's own wisdom. It's God's wisdom that we are supposed to seek. And um, 
when we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 20, we begin to see how Paul is defining that there is a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. So let's, let's read together. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made him, made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, Paul says there's a difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of this world. That the world will often view um, its best way to apply knowledge And the best way to put it into action, and that is very different than the way in which God would have us apply knowledge. And he he continues a little later. This is Paul again uh, to uh, the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 31. But we we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world to despise, uh, to, and despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, this is, this is the introduction to Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Uh, in that letter, he addresses a wide variety of issues to the church. And when you read a letter, the introduction, much like an essay, is going to give you a hint as to what is to come in this letter. Paul here is introducing what seems to be a common thread for all the issues plaguing the Corinthian church. See, they've chosen... The wisdom of this world over the wisdom of God. If you look in the section above this in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17, you'll see that one of the, the, the church's issues is that they're looking to the celebrity pastors of their day. And they're saying, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos. This would be the same today as saying, you know, I follow whatever celebrity pastor. I follow Ben. I follow Kevin. We're not celebrity pastors, but that's okay. Um, that is what they are doing. They are, 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 are making these, uh, th- these statements about who they are following And and Paul's trying to say, he's trying to tell the Corinthians that that's a worldly way of looking at wisdom. Where you judge the value of something by its flashiness or its appeal to your desire for your own knowledge or status. Paul really drives this point home near the end of his letter uh, when he's responding to some issues about spiritual gifts. See, some people are bragging that uh, they have this gift or another, uh, and and they're they're arguing over status and power based on which gift they have. 
And Paul tells them that they are wrong in their approach to these things. Here's what he says. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 13, 3. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed the church first, uh, uh, placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. What Paul is trying to say here is these gifts, these things that you are arguing over, the knowledge that you claim to have, the things that you are obtaining and trying to say, these are what make me special. He says, you need to desire something greater. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. See, here's what Paul is trying to get at. The true wisdom of God that we should all seek to possess is love. The only way that knowledge has value is if it's applied in love. So let's take a few minutes to unpack this. We get so caught up in chasing the things of this world. Accolades, degrees, knowledge, skills, all of which can be useful. But we do not chase after the one thing that unlocks their true power. Love. Paul says your accolades are useless if you cannot apply them in love. Your degrees are useless if you cannot put into action them with love. Your knowledge, your skills, all of it is useless without love. See, we, we, we like to run around and say like, I know this, I know that. And yet we don't actually apply those things in love. And I actually, I, I, I witnessed an example of this this morning with my kids. Um, and uh, before we were uh, about to leave, they were arguing over some toy, uh, which any parent will tell you is extremely common. And, uh, and they were arguing over this toy and Ezra says, sharing is caring. Hmm. And he makes that kind of pouty face. And Judah responds by saying, I know. And he turns around the other way and he's holding on to the toy. You see, it's interesting. They both have knowledge. They know that sharing is caring. And yet, neither one of them seeks to apply it in love. And so, sometimes we think that as parents, what we need to do is just give our kids knowledge. A lot of the times, they have it. They have the knowledge. We need to teach them love. And we are like children to God. We have a lot of knowledge. We know the right thing. But we're not applying it in love. And I know that I've gotten so caught up in these things that I've genuinely thought at times that the best thing that I can do when it comes to my faith is make sure that I'm the smartest person in the room. And Paul shakes his head at me. And he says, that's meaningless if you don't have love. Paul says that my aim should be to be the most loving person in the room. He says, who cares if you're the smartest? Knowing things does not help you. In fact, James drives home this point 
when he tells us that even the demons know the right things to believe. It's not about knowing the right things. It's about applying that knowledge in love. See, there are many of us today that can talk circles around people about the right way to look at things. Paul says it's useless if you don't have love. And there are many people who have a hard time articulating what it is that they actually believe, but they know how to love with the wisdom of God. Paul says, you are much further ahead. Ultimately, Paul is saying something interesting here about Jesus as well. Paul is essentially saying that, yes, Jesus had some amazing teaching. That there was a lot that we could learn from him. Knowledge to be gained. But the greatest lesson is the one that he shows us on the cross. That there is no love greater than this. That you lay down your life for the sake of others. In this age of information, I see a lot of people with knowledge. I see a lot of information just thrown out there and manipulated in different ways. In a world that is so divided on many different issues, there's a lot of yelling of facts. Paul says it just sounds like noise. I'm right, here's why. Blah, 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 blah. Paul says, if you can't show love, it doesn't matter if you're right. You're wrong. This is a hard teaching for some of us. Because we like to be right. We really like to be right. And we think that that somehow makes us righteous. But what Paul's teaching us here today is that the thing that matters most is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God, which is to apply everything that we learn and everything that we gain in love. See, we need people who will build their lives around not just what we can gain in knowledge, but rather that we would be building our lives around the love of God. And this is good news. This is really good news. Because you see, we don't all have the ability to learn and grow in knowledge. But we all have the ability to learn and grow in the wisdom of God. We all have the ability to learn and grow in love. Whether it's simply that, that we aren't gifted in the ways of, of knowledge and of the ways of this world. Whether we don't have the motivation or the capacity. We can't all reach the same heights of knowledge. There's always going to be somebody smarter than me. But everyone, everyone can grow in love. Each and every one of us has the same opportunity in front of us today. Will we spend time trying to accumulate the things of this world, the knowledge that this world tells us that we should be gaining? Or will we try to cultivate the gifts that God has given us and leverage them in love? See, Paul actually goes on to tell us what this looks like. He says, what does it look like when you apply God's wisdom to everything that you do? What does it look like when you use the knowledge that you have in love? So think about it this way as we're reading through this verse. First, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. And many of you have heard this before, but you've got to understand it in its context. This is coming right after he's talking about all of these these issues that, that the Corinthians are having. He says, love is patient. What does it look like when you apply the knowledge that you have with God's wisdom? It looks like patience. It looks like patience. Love is kind. What does it look like when you apply the gifts and the knowledge that you've been given with God's wisdom? It looks 
like kindness. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. The knowledge and wisdom of this world will pass away. Love will remain. What are we going to invest our lives in? I've got a couple of next steps here, some practical things that I, I want to challenge us with um, as, we, as we take this teaching into uh, the week. Uh, number one, think about the knowledge, skills, passions, and gifts that God has given you. Uh, many of you have been gifted with so many different things. You, you have a, a certain set of, of skills. You have, uh, you have knowledge that you have gained. Um, there are particulars that you have um, that other people do not have. Think about some of those things. Think about the ways in which God has blessed you like this. Think about the things that you are passionate about. Now, pray about ways that these things can be used to display God's love to others. This is where we, we lock into, we access God's wisdom, is how we're going to apply these things. Think about the different ways that you can do that. Maybe, maybe you are somebody who's extremely business savvy. What is a way that you can use your business acumen to love other people. Maybe, maybe you are somebody who is gifted in uh, ways of, of computer programming. What are ways that you can use your gift? What are ways that you can use your knowledge to love other people? And lastly, step out in faith and try new ways of embodying God's wisdom. I think about some of the things that, that people are doing around the church. I think about things like New Commandment Ministries, where you've got a, a bunch of people who have, who have gained skills for uh, just helping out around the house, doing um, handiwork um, and things like that. And they're using those skills, those gifts. They're taking that knowledge and using the wisdom of God to apply it in love. I think about those kinds of ministries. I think about um, some of the other classes, some of the other things that are going on at the church. And I just want to see more of it. And I want to see people being able to step out in faith, try new ways of embodying God's wisdom. And I promise you that this is, this is the way that we are going to feel that we are actually becoming the people that God has created us to be. And we will begin to see glimpses of God's kingdom here and now. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope this teaching is something that, that blesses you, that serves you, and that ultimately helps you grow in love.